Welcome to Winter Squash Grow Along, our third episode with Oren Martin and I'm Delise Weir. We'll start out with a little housekeeping about being on a Zoom, Zoom session. I'm sure you've all been on many of them, but you'll notice that you're muted and your video is off. Tonight, we are going to um, ask you to unmute at the end of the session so that you can tell us about your own gardens and your own squash and ask any questions you might have. Uh, during the slide event, you can, um, you can absolutely ask questions through the chat or through the Q&A function. We'll answer what we can through there and then uh, refer to the questions we can't answer to Oren at the end. We recommend you um, use the speaker view, which is the view that shows a big picture of whoever's talking. And Tips are to look at the bottom of your, of your screen. You should be able to mouse over and see some controls in your Zoom window. CC Live Transcript is a button that uh, you can turn on. And if you turn it on, when Oren is saying hilarious things, muttering at the end of his sentence, you will be able to see what he's saying across the screen and it will be poorly spelled. For technical assistance, you can chat directly with Vanessa. Ackerman, she is our tech wizard. And after class, we'll be sending you the presentation and a link to the video. And we'll also be sending you an evaluation survey to see how we did. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Oren. Hi folks, um, before I introduce myself and get going, um, uh, I'd like to do a little land acknowledgement. Uh, and so I'm gonna read a little short piece. UCSE, as well as CASFIS, the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems, and other organizations across the campus have authored a land acknowledgement statement regarding the unceded lands of the Amamutsun Tribal Band. Their ancestors walked and tended this land going back some eight to 10,000 years, truly First Peoples. These statements are commonly read at the outset of public presentations. Uh, you can read ours online, or I believe from click the blue at the base of the slide here. And it is good as far as it goes, but there's a risk with such statements, the fear that they will become rote, mechanical, thus hollow, you know, a bit like the Pledge of Allegiance and sometimes grace before a meal. So I'm going to go off script a bit here. Yes, we are intruders occupying the unceded tribal lands of the Amamutsun tribal band. So remember, at best, we are guests here. And also remember, to walk, talk, and act accordingly, humbly, and go lightly. And here are two quotes regarding the foundation of Mutsun culture and their worldview. Quote number one, there is no natural hierarchy in our culture that categorizes plants, animals, minerals, or humans as being above one another, unquote. Quote two, the creator placed the Mutsun in our homeland, these lands, as protectors and stewards of the land, waters, plants, and other creatures of this place. The creator blessed the Amamutsun with a mild, beautiful climate, bountiful foods from both land and sea, and a landscape that even today is considered among the most beautiful in the world." Unquote. So, it's my hope that we here at the UCSC Farm and Garden can treat the land and the soil under it, respectfully, as the Amamutsun did and still do today. They are in the process of trying to relearn and practice once again their ecological management uh, of the landscape here. And I might add, I had a former uh, intern who went to uh, get a master's at Berkeley and uh, uh, now she's doing a PhD, uh, and one of the things, she, her question, as it were, is how did the native peoples of the state of California manage their forests, and what are extracts we can draw from that in modern times to help us manage forests better as the climate changes? Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, you got my... Uh, bona fides as it were on the left here. But what I want you to focus on is, look at that guy, he's hoeing garlic. Nice garlic crop, yeah. Uh, uh, nice guy, that's me. Um, but what's of note here is the hoe that I am using. It's called a collinear hoe. It was uh, developed, invented by a farmer, thinker, tinker, inventor, Elliot Coleman, sold by Johnny Seeds and Peaceful Valley Farms Supply has it. It's a 
really exquisite hoe. It's a preemptive weeding tool. You get the weeds when they're even pre-emergent, what's called the thread stage. There's just a little white thread when you scuffle the soil where the seedling was about to pop through the soil or when the, uh, the, the, it's at the tule stage uh, above the ground. Uh, and it does very little disruption to the soil. You can be very precise. There's a three inch blade and a seven inch blade. You can use them interchangeably to work in tight spaces of in, in intensive plantings. And uh, the beauty of it is, as, uh, as you can see here, it's a hoe that's a draw hoe, not a chopping or a pull hoe. So you can stand up straight. You, you use it with your thumbs up as if you were <clears throat> ballroom dancing. Dancing, not that nobody does that <laughs> days anymore. Um, uh, anyhow, uh, cool tool, the collinear hoe. Check it out. Next slide. Uh, this event, like many of the Zooms we've give, been giving over the last year and many of the workshops we've given since uh, the 1970s and will continue to hopefully give in person come fall, winter this year. It's brought to you by the uh, Friends of the UCSC Farm and Garden and our affiliate support group. They're great in every respect. Uh, and you might want to consider joining them, becoming a member. There are some perks if you live in the area. There are several nurseries, as you see here, that give a discount for members of the Friends of the Farm and Garden. You also get in early uh, admission to our plant sales. Uh, and uh, we have a quarterly newsletter chock full of horticultural information and other events, related events that are happening or come upcoming. Uh, and more than that, if you join the Friends of the Farm and Garden, you will be supporting me, not just me, my colleagues and I, uh, who are uh, uh, lifelong, uh, what is it? We are servants of the season and the morning's early light. Uh, we teach the next generation how to farm organically. So consider it. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a grow along. We are doing an experiment here. This is our third in a series of classes following a single crop. The idea was to, um, um, make the experience for you a virtual version of actually uh, working in the garden over the course of a growing season. So it's intended to be a dialogue, a back and forth conversation, not a one-sided conversation. And we um, look forward to having you supporting each other and us learning from you and um, finding out what's going on with your garden, especially today, because we've passed the point where we're just getting started and our plants should be growing and in the ground now. And here's where we are in the grow along. We're on today's class. We're gonna talk about watering, feeding, training, a little bit about pest protection, pollination, and um, what is going on with you guys. We're gonna also preemptively, um, September 10th, Orrin is not able to join us. So we're gonna talk about harvest and things that can happen late season briefly, and then we'll have an optional class uh, without Oren where we can just ourselves if uh, so inclined. So that's what's happening there. Okay, um, let's do a little check in here. Uh, and the dog ate my homework, it's always usable. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Let's focus on the first thing here. Uh, you may or may not have done this, uh, but something you want to do at the outset uh, on any piece of ground when you're uh, one of the many things you would do to uh, uh, kind of check out a piece of ground. And let's do a percolation test, commonly called percolation. Simply dig a hole about 12 by 12, fill it with water, let it drain, and then come back and fill it again. Uh, it should drain within three or four hours, certainly overnight. If not, you've got a problem. You've got a serious drainage problem. And what can you do? Uh, what you can do is engage in good soil practices, and that's kind of at the confluence of tillage, digging or plowing, and cover crops and compost. And this is not a quick fix. This is a long-term process. Uh, but it, even in the most wretched of soils, I would say conservatively, within three to five years, you could have a fairly deep fertile soil that will drain well and grow good crops. It is especially important to have good drainage with winter squash. Uh, they are uh, very sensitive to wet feet. Uh, and uh, it's good to have good drainage. If you pass the perk test, as it were, that means your soil structure is good. You may have a sand, silt, or clay. Uh, you've got what you've got. You can't change it. Don't try. That's your soil texture. But your soil structure is something that you can 
maintain if it's good or improve if it's poor, or you could even mess up and, and, and degrade it, but don't do that. Um, and uh, so uh, in an idealized soil with good structure, uh, only half of the uh, space in the soil is occupied by the solids. That would be the mineral component and the compost. The rest is pore spaces or the gaps between the solids. The better your soil structure, the better your drainage, uh, the better uh, off you are as a result of cumulative good practices. The more pore space you have, air and water occupy pore space. So you'll have more water, you have more air. Air with its vital oxygen for root growth and microbial respiration. Uh, water, water, well, hey, water is the pulse of the planet necessary uh, for plant growth and also nutrients get into plant dissolved in water like that. So good soil practices yield good drainage but beyond that good structure and uh, a, a good reservoir for water and, and air. Uh, the adage about uh, good soil and Good soil, good or organic matter compost, or adding compost to your soil, is that it's compost is a drought buster. It really is a sponge and holds water. Um, and then let's just take a sec here and talk about uh, at this juncture in the season, uh, if you either direct seeded or transplanted in May, early June, you should have pretty good plant establishment, vegetative plant establishment by now. Um, at the farm, we have plants that are at full canopy, anywhere from uh, two feet to four feet across. And the anywhere from two to four feet is basically a function of, is it a vining, long vining type with big fruit or is it a short bush type, say delicata with smaller fruit like that. But you should have pretty good, almost full uh, plant canopy establishment. And then comes tendrils or runners and squashes usually send one in each direction, 180 degrees long runners or proportionally long runners as per the size of the plant and fruit. And then they'll make uh, offsets off that. And then they'll go to flowering. We're just starting, here we are, July the 7th, right? Uh, just starting to get some flowers on our uh, uh, well-established squash in the field at the farm. Um, and uh, then comes hopefully pollination of fruit set. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, next slide. Watering, watering in a drought. We here in California specifically, uh, Western United States are in a drought, a multi-year drought. But the way I look at it is California is always in a water shortage. If you look at where our water accumulates the most, it's the north part of the state. And where have we developed the most? The mid and the south part of the state. So it's about taking water from the north and shipping it as it were to the south. Uh, and in the best of times, this has worked uh, for the better part of a century. Uh, in the present time and going forward, I don't know. Um, so as I said, uh, the best thing you can do is to improve the organic matter content of your soil in terms of water holding capacity with compost and cover crops. Uh, mulch is uh, really great, especially with winter squash. It's just uh, really, it, when we started using a wood chip mulch at the Chadwick Garden on our fruit trees 30 something years ago, uh, we were able to reduce the amount of waterings we did by almost one half. So it really caps in moisture lower surface uh, evaporation. And whatever that mulch is, leaf, straw, uh, wood chips, uh, uh, it will break down and add nutrients to the soil and also in turn build the organic matter content of the soil and also improve structure and also hold wa help watering uh, uh, water capacity, water holding capacity. Um, um, in terms of watering, uh, you need to water proportional to the development of the plant. In the beginning of the crop, if you're just germinating seeds, it may take one or two light sprinkles a day. As the crop establishes, it may take wetting once every two to three days down to four or five inches like that. Once the crop is established, as it should be now, um, you want to water in a manner that gets the soil wet at least 10 to 18 inches deep and as wide. Squash roots have both deep and wide roots like that. Um, and uh, you want to go out and you want to test the soil to determine whether you uh, need to water. I do this every four or five days, at least once a week. I'll go down to whatever root depth, I think the, uh, whatever depth I think the roots are, I'll grab a handful of soil and I'll try to gently ball it up. 
If it doesn't ball up, it's way too dry. You should have watered previously. Don't let that happen again. Move up your intervals between watering. If it balls up and then if you toss it a little and thumb it, it just gently falls apart. That is probably what is called technically field capacity, but what is what I call good growing moisture. You're good. Don't water it quite yet, if, if, but you need to keep an eye on it, probably two, three, four days down, down the line. Um, we water our squashes about once a week. If it gets inordinately hot, we'll do it more frequently. Um, and if you ball it up and it's wet and sticky and you get a little stain on your paw, uh, it's too wet, too wet in the sense that you, A, shouldn't dig a soil that wet, but B, or in this case, A, uh, you uh, don't need to water, so just carry on. Like that. Um, overhead watering. Overhead watering is not very efficient. It's done and it can be a, a, an aid in some situations. I won't go into it right now, but it can be a very valuable tool. But here, here's the deal. Overhead watering, when you apply water with any kind of sprinkler, only it's the maximum efficiency is 80%. That is 80% of the water you're putting out actually ever gets into the soil. If it's hot, sunny, and windy, your watering efficiency could be well below 20%. It just goes off in the vapors, as it were, like that. So that's a, one of the perils of overhead watering. Drip tape or uh, tea tape, as used on farms, inline drip, uh, are much more efficient. Your efficiency approach 100 percent, um, and uh, it's kind of just more more efficient like that. Um, the other thing is that overhead watering, in this case with winter squash and in plants in general, not all plants, can uh, injure leaves and also cause uh, leaf diseases. In the case of winter squash, your two principal diseases are the two types of mildew, powdery and downy, and they've got you coming and going as it were. The downy mildew um, happens when it's cool and wet, early in the season, or if you live on the coast, if it's foggy in the summer, throughout the season. Uh, uh, the powdery mildew likes warm and humid and a little drier, but uh, mildew is a big problem and uh, overhead watering exacerbates it. So uh, there you go. Um, and it's possible if you just have a small garden of a couple plants, you can definitely hand water. You see the uh, slide on the bottom here. Watering early in the day so the foliage can dry out as quick as possible uh, at the beginning of a warm day is probably your best prescription. And it is important to get water into soil and get water up into the plant. Uh, photosynthesis does not proceed unless there's adequate water in the, in the leaf and you get it there by watering early in the day. So the plant can take advantage of warm sunny, sunny days, photosynthesize, make sugars and grow uh, like that. Um, so that's okay, we could probably move on now. Oh, the wilting thing. Uh, you uh, go out in the middle of the afternoon, it's 78, 82, 84 degrees, whatever, uh, and your squash leaves are huge squash leaves are just wilting down. You freak out and you go to water. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, what's happening is the plant, and plants do this, uh, if uh, it's hot, and they're transpiring and losing a lot of moisture. They close the stoma mates, the tiny stomatic opening is on the bottom of microscopic openings on the bottom of the leaf, so they don't lose any more water. And they, as a consequence, will. Now you should check the soil. If the soil is dry, then water. But if it's not, it's just this shutdown, a self-defense mechanism for the plant. One of the problems with that is, uh, especially because water stress cause, is that when the plant closes its stomata, these microscopic openings on the underside of the plant, they can no longer take in carbon dioxide, dioxide from the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide in the, from the atmosphere, water from the soil, broken apart with sunlight energy, recombined into carbohydrates by the plant via photosynthesis it was, is what grows the plant. So. We can move on now. Hey, hey, Oren, how do you feel about um, answering a watering question? We can. Oh, yeah, sure. A question as uh, far away as they come up, absolutely. Okay. Um, you answered one of them. The other one is how do you know that you're watering 10 to 18 inches deep? That's pretty easy. Uh, you probe down 10 to 18 inches. Now, you can do this with a hand trowel or a spade. But there are uh, little devices that you can get soil probes. You can get them at any uh, farm supply operation, and it just goes down and it takes a little. It, it's about this this much diameter. It takes a core, and you can see what's the depth of penetration. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I never do that. Well, I don't do it exactly. After a while of doing that, I can just take a trowel and go down about six inches, and I can 
Ah, not, All right. Show yeah. that. Well, that was great. Boy, That's the soil well, from. This is so on her game. Look at this. Uh, it's the best 68 bucks you ever send, may, spend, maybe. Anyhow, uh, uh, what I do is I go down about six, eight inches with a trowel. It's easier. I'm lazy. And I can, I can gauge, having done this more thoroughly in the past, if I'm this wet at six inches, I'm this wet at, at 12 or 18 inches or so. But it's the thing about watering is it, there's no hocus pocus there. It's just like you go and you check, do I need to water? You do a field field test as I just uh, described. You water, assume nothing, go and check. Did I penetrate to the depth and width that I want? And if not, apply more water. If it's too wet, then you know the next time you could apply a little less water. Uh, the, the books say apply one to two inches per week with winter squash, and uh, that can work, but also can be a little uh, shy. So I just do a empirical test. You can also use a hori hori. You use it not right where the roots are, but off to the side a little bit. That'll get good you points there. One is a hori hori, hori uh, indispensable garden tool. So many uh, uses for it. Uh, but the uh, other thing, the other good point that Lisa made, do this out towards the edge of the plant's canopy away from the root nets. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, pests, pests and diseases, I talked a little bit about diseases, the two mildews being the principal. Uh, uh, culprits uh, and uh, your watering practices, that is not engaging in overhead watering, uh, can aid you quite a bit. Uh, 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 but here's the deal, let me just linger a little bit on uh, mildew. Uh, uh, I would say in all probability, you're going to get mildew one or the other or both before the end of the season. And in fact, you may towards the end of the season completely lose your foliage uh, because of these diseases. And that just comes with the territory with squash. The issue is to grow a plant, establish it quickly in a healthy vegetative manner, flower, set fruit, enlarge fruit, and go as long into the season as you can before you get hit. Uh, with mildew, and, and it usually works out. Uh, up along the coast here, uh, between Santa Cruz and Half Moon Bay, uh, it's, uh, have a big pumpkin fest going in the fall, and there's just acres and acres and acres of pumpkins. And by the time, and it's very foggy on the coast, and by the time you get to September prior to harvest, you can see those pumpkins ripening in the field because uh, uh, the foliage is gone from, uh, uh, because of mildew. Oh, because I'm mentioning pumpkins here, I'm going to hold up a piece of art that my wife, is. she's an artist, she does. Uh, Intaglio, yeah, let me unshare for a second so we can all see it. Intaglio copper plate etchings. So, uh, sorry about the glare. Uh, but this is the Rouge Vif de Tom, pardon my French. It's the Cinderella pumpkin. You're only going to grow one variety of pumpkin. This is the one you want to grow, one for its outrageousness and its beauty, uh, but also it's a darn good soup and stew pump, pumpkin like that. And uh, uh, artists take liberties. Uh, now, this is a pumpkin that I'm going to say is in reality approaching uh, maturation. Yeah. There's some foliage, but you also see uh, in the lower corner, there's some senescing fo foliage and, and that's that's the way it goes. Your pumpkins may completely senesce, die back foliage wise, or may have partial dieback. But what's important here indicating why I think this pumpkin was mature is you look at the stem. It's brown, dry, and corky. You don't want, uh, actually, uh, if we go back to the uh, first slide that uh, there's a bunch of squash on it. Let's, can we go back to that, Elise? Okay, let me share again. Hold that thought. Yes, I can do what I'm doing here. Yeah. And you want to go to the first slide? Yeah, the one all those beautiful squashes. These ugly pests. That's horrible <laughs> pests out of the way. Oh, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, indicators of, of maturation, I'm just going to jump to this right now, uh, is uh, unlike, this is uh, kind of like some food stylist put this together, no doubt. <laughs> uh, uh, not a true gardener or farmer. Uh, you see how immature the uh, stems are. They're still green. You want your stems to be brown, dry, and quirky. But 
it's a little bit on the edge here because you see the discoloration on a couple of the a couple of these pumpkins, the white and the kind of orange. That's called ground color, and it is one of the indicators of maturation. So uh, there are multiple indicators of maturation. Uh, uh, senescence dieback of the foliage, yeah. Uh, the lack of green in the stem, yeah. And a good ground color development are some of the indicators. Also, uh, there's this thing called a grower's dilemma. And that is um, retailers want pumpkins and squ winter squash when they're vibrant and bright, whatever their color, uh, uh, shiny. Uh, but that's an immature stage. You need to leave the pumpkins on the vine a little longer because they actually start to cure while they're still growing in the latter phases of growth. And what happens is the water content reduces and the, uh, the sugar and starch balance gets better, better in terms of giving you, yeah, dry, the starch gives you dry, but the sugar gives you sweet and smooth texture like that. The retailers want squash that look pretty, they don't care uh, about taste so much, although they should, uh, uh, and they don't like it that the, the pumpkin loses, or the squash loses, loses water weight because they sell it by the pound, so. Um, you just have to be a smart shopper. And I i can't count the number of times. I stopped buying commercial squash. It's just not so good because of these factors. But you can grow your own and we can go to pest now. Hey, um, Oren, Peggy wants to know if it's too late to start squash. Uh, where does Peggy live? Uh, Peggy, can you unmute and tell us where you live? I asked her, but I have, I haven't heard back in the chat. San Jose. Thank you, Peggy. You know, you, <clears throat> I'm going to go out on a limb. After all, isn't that where the fruit is? Um, um, you, say you could. It's a tad bit late, but you could. If you could get a transplant and put it in the ground from the nursery now, that would be quite a bit better. I could pretty much assure you or mature. You live in California, you live in one of the coastal valleys where it's warm and, and dry in the summer. We get, we used to get rain in the winter, uh, but our summer often persists well into October, even beyond. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the 7th of June, July, August, September, October. You know, you might be able to squeak it in. Look for two things. Look for varieties that are small fruited, delicata, sweet dumpling, acorn like that, and and uh, don't go don't go growing the Tahitian melon squash, which is two and a half feet long, uh, 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 and rant will take over your neighborhood. Um, um, and um, uh, look uh, look for early maturing. Look at the days to mature. You'd like under a hundred days, ninety to hundred days like that. Um, give it a shot and report back. Great. All right, pests it is. Oh, pests, right. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> beautiful in a sense. Uh, <laughs> this is a squash bug. Uh, and what do you do if you have squash bugs? Oh, it's easy, you squash them. Um, uh, let me just say there that winter squash is not a particularly uh, pest or a prone crop, and yet there are some, we'll go over them a little bit here. And uh, there's not a heck of a lot you can do organically. It's a few tricks, but not a lot. Again, the, the issue is always to establish a plant po po a, po a positive plant approach. Establish a good vegetative plant early. Uh, most of the uh, these these insects will either chew or suck uh, leaves, and as the squash plant matures, the leaf gets tougher thicker, more bristly, and it's less attractive. And you usually have more problems when the plant is establishing when the foliage is more succulent and uh, uh, yummy to them like that. Uh, and look at those eggs. I, that's just an amazing shot, even though it can be a devastating pest. Uh, next hey, one. Warren, yeah. earlier, were you talking about something called ground color when you were talking about red? Yeah, I, 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 I was. Wherever the squash sits on the ground, excluded from the light, as it approaches maturation, you don't see this until you harvest it and you look at the underside. Now, it may be the uh, squash don't always sit like this. They sit every which way they can like that. Well, whatever's on the bottom will often develop either often a, a, a really nice kind of 
autumnal orange or yellow and sometimes a white. And that was an evidence on some of those slides there. It is one of the indicators of maturation. Indicators of maturation, let's go over them again. Or actually add to this. Uh, the vines are starting to die back or they have died back. It's been 90, 100, 120 days since you either seeded or transplanted. Um, and uh, you take your uh, sharp thumbnail and, and you scratch the, uh, the rind and it shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to penetrate it much. That rind is hard and that's going to contribute to good storage like that. Um, and uh, with pumpkins, there are people who can bonk them and they can tell by the hollow sound, ripe or not ripe. I am not in that subset of the human species, but a uh, skill you might uh, develop if you know a pumpkin farmer somewhere nearby. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's the uh, usual suspects with, with squash. Squash bugs, a, 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 as I said, uh, and the squash vine bore, let me also say, here in Santa Cruz, we occasionally have some problems with the squash bug, but not a lot. And I'm not sure if I've actually ever seen a squash vine borer. That yep. can be a problem in some areas, particularly in the upper Midwest. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, go into the stem and you get a collapse. The squash bug can go into the leaf or the stem and, and the whole plant collapses. Let me just say two things. And one is that there's a bacterial wilt that winter squashes get that looks like that. The wilt is wilt. There's nothing to do. You've got a wilted plant. It's not wilted because of water problems. It's just plant collapse um, uh, like that. Also, uh, uh, particularly all, all of these three uh, will carry uh, our vectors for various viruses and also for uh, bacterial wilt. Uh, so they can uh, cause damage beyond the damage of them simply chewing on the leaves. Uh, let's look at the uh, so squash bugs and, uh, and, and squash vine borers. Um, the um, flea beetle is a pretty ubiquitous thing here on the Central Coast, particularly if you live adjacent to uh, dry grassland, and particularly as the grassland dries down in May, May, May and June. At the UCSC farm, we can't grow Asian greens uh, very well in the spring unless we completely wrap them with a remade uh, poly uh, row cover uh, and it just simply excludes them. Um, and then uh, the flea beetle is just seasonal. It's usually a problem for a period of time, May into June, and it tapers off. I might add, also add that uh, they really like eggplant leaves too. Um, so uh, let's go to the shot of the uh, cucumber beetle. The, Diabrotica beetle, yeah. Uh, the uh, cucumber beetle, sometimes uh, called the diabrotica beetle. Uh, let me also say that uh, UC Davis, these websites are excellent for explaining what the pest is, its life cycle, and what you can do. Um, they sometimes give organic recommendations, not always. Um, um, so uh, the cucumber beetle, uh, I think the Central Coast is ground zero for uh, California for cucumber beetles and they've been on the, on the rise. They're a problem more on cucumbers, hence the name, than they are on winter squash, but they can be a problem. And they also really like any white flowers. So if you're trying to grow cosmo, white cosmos or white dahlias, uh, they chew on the petals. That's what, and then they <clears throat> crap on them too. Really bad. Okay, um, and it comes in two forms, as you see here. One is called the 12 spotted western cucumber beetle, and the other one has a, a, a different uh, a design to it, like that. Um, so, uh, uh, the issue is again protecting the plants when the young getting good uh, 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 establishment. Uh, there are pheromone trapplers for the squine, the squash borer. I, like I said, I've never seen any, never had a problem, never used them. The idea of uh, in, uh, biodiversity, encouraging, fostering biodiversity, uh, growing uh, a diversity of plants in a very thick canopy to attract what I call the three Ps, uh, pollinators, native and non-native. I'll get to pollination in a minute. Uh, and uh, uh, predators and parasitoids. That's just uh, two groupings for beneficial insects. These are insects that uh, can predate on detrimental insects and uh, their effect in a well-managed biodiverse, even backyard garden or farm is considerable. Uh, and pretty much any member of the sunflower or the daisy family, the Asteraceae family, which is the large, largest dicotyledonous plant family on the planet, there are 25,000 species, uh, 
is a huge attractant of beneficials. Yarrow is a particularly good one and a beautiful fresh and dried cut flower. A good combination, and it works out pretty cool, is to just lightly grow sunflowers in your winter squash patch. Uh, and they're very good at attracting Apis mellifera of the European honeybee. But it could be bees, na bees, native bees, non-native bees, bumblebees. There's even a squash bee. It's a great example of coevolution. Uh, so, uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, yeah, there are nasturtiums as an example of a trap crop. Uh, I mentioned the floating row uh, fabric covers. Uh, you see one on the right. Oh my goodness, this is the dreaded Colorado potato beetle on a patch of potatoes. This must be east of the Rockies because thankfully the Colorado potato uh, beetle hasn't figured out how to scale the Rockies yet. I imagine it's just a matter of time before it hitchhikes a ride and gets out here. But uh, any type of insect that you want to keep off foliage, this floating row cover stuff, commonly the brand name is Rime, is it, excellent. Uh, uh, point made here at the bottom of the slide, this will prevent pollinators from getting in, so you should take it off around the time of flowering and or you can hand pollinate. Uh, reflective mulch, uh, I've just used it a little, it's actually a growing trend in orchards and they were using it down in the Pajaro Valley in Watsonville here because it's pretty cool and foggy here to get some light bounce back into the canopy to get more heat and more sugar development on, on on uh, fruits in this case, but it works well on peppers and, and tomatoes as well. How it works with the uh, uh, insects, it's kind of disoriented, kind of like they went to the pub and had three Guinnesses and they have two close together and they just get totally disoriented. Okay, move on. Uh, let's see, uh, squashes, winter squashes in this case have two different types of flowers on the same plant. They're called monoecious. Mon meaning one or solo. Uh, Ishes coming from oikos in the Greek meaning house. So male and female flowers on the same plant. And uh, uh, on the left you have a male, well actually on the right of this slide you have a nice profile on the uh, of a male flower on the left and a, and a female flower on the right. The males flower first and in a much greater abundance than the females. Uh, the males carry uh, pollen on their stamen. And if you look at the circle on the left slide here, you'll see the stamen with, with a pollen. If you, on a warm day, just dab your finger on it, it should be sticky. Um, the female flowers are more squat and broad, and they already come, as you see on the far right here, with a little nub and fruit. Now, if, it gets, if the fl female flower gets pollinated by the pollen from the male flower, that squash will continue to grow and enlarge. If not, it'll shrivel and, and, and die. So uh, you want to keep an eye on your uh, squash plants uh, as they bloom. And note, is there insect, winged insect activity, uh, bees particularly? Are you set in fruit? Now be patient, as I said, one of the males precede the males in number and in time by sometimes a number of weeks. Uh, uh, but uh, do you have activity? Look and see. Uh, are those little nubbin fruits taking? Are they enlarging? If so, you're good to go. Now also keep in mind that winter squash, some of the bigger fruit types only bear two or three fruit per vine. Some of the smaller things like the baby butternuts will have eight to 10 fruit. So uh, you, you can look in Johnny's seed catalog. They have a great, uh, great descriptions of squashes. And one of the things they'll tell you is how many, approximately how many fruit you can expect per vine. Uh, okay, we could move on. Uh, so uh, you may need to hand pollinate if you're not getting, if you don't have insects and you're not, you're not getting a fruit set. Or you might just like, hey, it's a cool way to pass the time. Let's hand pollinate. Uh, find a male flower. Uh, do this best done in the heat of the day. Um, and just pluck it off. I would peel back the petals uh, or cut them off. So you have the stamen exposed with the pollen. And you simply find a female flower. And you dab it in there. And you want to be thorough. You can't just go boom. You want to go ch -ch 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 like that or even more. Um, and that should do the job. Uh, so uh, check it out, try it out. Next. Oh, look, something like that. 
There you go. Next. So, Oren, why and when would you do hand pollination? Why would I do it? Um, I would do it if I was a plant breeder, but I'm not, so I don't. Um, I, I, uh, uh, I would do it if I noticed that I didn't have fruit set. And I would do it, you know, again, I, I advise patience with squash. You know, the first few female flowers may not get pollinated. Uh, but just keep an eye on them over at this time of year going forward into August, you know, certainly by big up mid-August, you should have fruit set. If it ain't happening, you, know, you can be at the ready. So urban situations where there aren't a lot of pollinators. Yeah. Uh, where there's, sh uh, it's a problem because they're kind of starting and then dropping off. Yeah. Although um, there's a lot of emerging research that's showing that a lot of urban gardens particularly community gardens are really biodiverse and rich pollinators. But yeah, that, that might be an, an, an instance, yeah. Or like you say, because you want to save seed, but if you want to save seed, and you have to keep it. No, I mean, if you're a plant breeder and you're trying to develop a new variety, which is way beyond the scope of this talk and our capabilities. <laughs> uh, and if you do that, you need to uh, exclude, you just need to be having growing one variety and you need to get your pollen source from another variety that's grown uh, maybe two or three miles away. It's, it's. And all your neighbors need to grow only one variety. So <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing to do. Neighborhood movement, yes. Uh, so at any rate, uh, okay. Somebody Pick wants to know if all squash flowers are yellow. Jeez, good question. Hey. <laughs> Stumped the chump. Uh, yeah, I think they are. I've never seen another one. Never seen another. I mean, they they, they, go, they go from rich orange yellow shades to down to kind of pale yellow, margarine color or something. But I think they are. Okay. Uh, I preempted this a little bit, but let's go over. You you want to? When I say shiny and vibrant, I know some of these are not the most bright colored things, but it's a, it's a relative term. You want to go past that. Uh, the, 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 you have an opportunity to really zone in on squash this year, folks. Uh, so watch your squash. Oh, look, and then look how it gets a little dull, loses some luster. That's an indicator of, of uh, maturation. Again, you, you can't scratch the uh, skin, uh, and that's important for storage. Uh, uh, dark, uh, woody, dry, corky not green and juicy stem, uh, leave a stem. Stem on what is an orange, an apple, uh, in this case a winter squash is important. It's a buffer between the item and the environment and rot organisms getting into that uh, item. It's winter squash in this case. Uh, and let me just say that uh, while you generally leave a maybe one to two inch, maybe three or four inch uh, 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 stem uh, and you wanna cut the fruit off the vine, not yank it. Um, with pumpkins, you want to leave a good six, eight inch stem. It's, in the pumpkin business, they call it the handle. And a uh, pumpkin grower say, it's the handle that sells the uh, pumpkin. And it's just, there's just a marvelous array of different shapes and sizes. Leave a stem. Uh, uh, if you live along, the, uh, if you live in California, you uh, just let the vine senesce. And kind of uh, towards the end, uh, you give them one last watering, and they cut water for a couple of weeks before you harvest. Um, and uh, if you live where there are frosts, a light frost or two will actually cause sugar development. Um, if you live in the east, even darn Brussels sprouts would be sweet. Things get sweeter as you go into the fall. With cold night temperatures, even a touch of frost, the reaction of the plant is to develop sh sugar. Sugar lowers the freezing point. So it's the kind of a uh, life insurance or antifreeze like that. The dividend is that we get sweeter carrots, Brussels sprouts, or uh, winter squash in this case. Uh, but hard, hard freezes are detrimental to the squash, could be injured in the field, or it will shorten the storage life uh, like that. Um, some folks actually do wash their squash off with water and then dry them. I think it's better to, to towel off the so dirt or soil on it before you store them. Uh, okay, next. Hey, Oren, Lily wants to know if um, you should remove any yellow leaves on the vine. Uh, as, as it's growing, um, whatever makes you happy. Uh, if, if you get to a tipping point with leaves where 
they're not functional anymore. You might as well get them out of the scene. And, and they could be a vector for disease as they kind of uh, uh, dehydrate like that. So yeah, sure. I mean, don't go and defoliate your plants. Uh, this is the California cure as it were. Typically, uh, uh, you, uh, cut and, you, you go up and down the coast, you see pumpkins in the field, uh, acres and acres of them. Uh, leave them on the ground. You might turn them once or twice, 10, 14 days, wipe dry and store. Uh, and wherever you're storing your, your pumpkins and or, or uh, winter squash, you can check them once a month to make sure they're not rotten. The old adage, one rotten apple spoils the barrel, is true with squashes as well. Or any storage crop. Next. Uh, this is uh, more of the same, basically. Uh, moderate temperatures, probably 50 to 60 degrees. Moderate humidity, 50 to 70% are good conditions for storage. Uh, this at the bottom here of, of Curing your pumpkins indoors or in a ventilated room or shed with heat fans um, is good, but it's also very dicey. Uh, you can rot the pumpkins, especially at this at, at the recommended kind of temperature. So you want to keep an eye on it. Air circulation is critical in, in, in that circumstance, and if you have high humidity, it's going to be even more of a problem. But even in the east, they do a lot of northeast. They do a lot of field curing of pumpkins, just making sure they get them out of the field before heavy frost. Okay. Uh, I think I said this. Uh, this Johnny's chart uh, and uh, other uh, related char charts that Johnny's have is, is fabulous. They have some really great stuff. Uh, this is a go, let's look at this, yeah. Uh, stuff about curing and storing and, you know, kind of optimal uh, keeping time. And it's just, they have many charts like this. It's really a storehouse of information and you know, very accurate. So, okay, I think uh, we're getting near the end there. Oh, well, no, we have to admire Delisa's squash. Tell us about your squash. Well, I'm hoping that other people will share their squashes with us, but uh, this is a delicata. It came from, um, I think I sent it to you guys in an email. Um, came from row seven. And it has this absolutely gorgeous silvery leaf, and it would be an it would be an excellent ornamental. I next year I think I'll try it in a container because I thought it was going to have vines. I've got a middle trellis in the back, and it was going to grow up, but it is in fact a nice little bush, and it's got a lot of fruit, as you can see down here. Fruit is setting all over it, yeah. so happy days. Uh, the delicatas in general have a silver tinge to their foliage. This is beyond the pale, so cool. Yeah, it's like fairy dust on it. And then we got some email from Dara. She's growing kabocha, sugar pie, Cinderella, which is the rouge de vif de ton, and uh, delicata. Uh, I got Let us, we will look at her, at her pictures. Uh, you know, you've got canopy development, you've got a nice little mulch there, and you've got an enlarging uh, pumpkin of some type. Uh, uh, still still going, still growing. Cool. Dara, are you on the call? Yeah, it's Dara, actually. Dara, sorry. That's all right. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your squash patch. Okay, most of what, it is quite a patch. Most of what you see um, in the orange are sugar pie pumpkins, and... Pie is, New England sugar pie is maybe the best pumpkin pie, in my opinion. Yeah, they make the best everything. Um, they are growing next to the kabochas, which are still pretty green. Yeah. Um, the reason, yeah, I have, a, I have probably... Yeah, there's there's probably eight plants in that one section, um, and then there are other places in the yard. Uh -huh. um, oh, that's my del one of my delicatas, which I am actually doing an experiment. Um, I have seeded everything, and my first delicatas did not really do well from seed, so I have a second set that's getting ready to go on the ground. So we'll see if I can if I can. Uh, Get good fruit from them. Where do you live? Uh, Live Oak, about two miles from Pleasure Point. You are my neighbor. Oh, really? It's pretty much a perfect place, I would say. Cool. Yeah, nice real estate, pricey real estate, but nice. Uh, uh, is that the green kabocha there? Is that yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, the the kaboshas, you know, some people say the dull green, but man, they're 
I see them as people. And, and the reason things are big and ripening up so quick is because I actually, for this, this year, um, grew all my own plants from seed. And by the time we had our first class, I believe my squash were already in the ground and were probably a good six to eight inches long. And I was like, oh my God, I jumped the gun, holy crap. So yeah. hence they survived. We didn't have any bad weather and they're-, they're you're, you're, you're ready for graduate studies with winter squash. <laughs> well, this is my garden of 10 years. So I've learned a lot. Yeah, I bet you have. Um, so, uh, wow. And then the little leaf burn there. We had that heat wave and uh, leaf scorched leaf burn. Some of the apples got sunburned. Uh, uh, although we were lucky, we didn't get the 115 degrees that Portland got. Uh, my my uh, wife's uh, friend's daughter is a ranger in Olympic uh, Park up there uh, where they filmed Twilight or something in Western Washington. 107 there. Oh. Wow. That one is a Cinderella and um, it's growing. There's some fennel and ginger behind it and it's using that to climb up the fence of my chicken yard. So I used to joke with my kids with when they were young, I'd say, don't, don't stand there too long. The squash will start grabbing you. It, it, yeah, <laughs> it will. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent, excellent. And then this is a, just a kind of a ridiculous little uh, thing I built to get a delicata off the ground. It's growing next to some tomatoes and I might actually let it grow up onto the tomatoes because they're on some pretty serious supports. Are you giving it a seat cushion? That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> that was my reading chair until the squash grew up. Okay. Does anybody else have any, uh, any pictures to share? Point area, huh? That you can send to us through the chat. Thanks for sharing, but thanks for growing. Boy, that's beautiful. No, I was excited to uh, be able to send in some pictures because I'm I'm I grew a lot of squash last year, but I've got even more this year, so I'm pretty excited. The trouble is, like so many things, it can be downright addictive. <laughs> it is indeed. It's a, 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 gate, a gateway gardening drug. Uh, okay, any other questions? Thank you, Dara. Yeah, now it's time for office hours with Oren. Anybody can ask any question. Nothing's off limits. This is my office in the picture here on the porch. Yeah. I don't actually. Yeah, I have, I have a question. I'm Terry. And um, I'm, I'm in a kind of a, I'm gardening for the second year near Loma Prieta Mountain in the Chaparral area, south facing slope. Very uh, hot, very yeah. sunny. Um, I've added uh, two years in a row about six inches of compost and haven't dug it in. I forked it in. You know, I stuck the fork in, rocked the fork back and forth, digging fork, not a pitchfork. Um, the Maybe. plants have been a little bit spindly, but I, one of the things I want to try to do with the squash is even with the ones that are more bushy, like the, what I call Romanesco, but it's a zucchini type, uh -huh. is to vine them, is to put strings to up the concrete wall, retaining wall. And can you do that with the heavy squash? Uh yeah, you can. I don't think you can do it with string per se. Uh, what do you use instead of? I use a couple different things. Uh, I get this rigid fencing. It's sometimes called hog paneling or horse paneling. It has four inch squares. Yeah, right. Welded wire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, it's not the type that rolls. It's sheets and it's great. And you just put a couple of posts on it, tack it up. And then I. Uh, also use a thing called Horta Nova flower netting, which you can get from Peaceful Valley Farm Supply uh, uh, and uh, uh, mail order it. And um, uh, I stretch it pretty tightly with uh, zip ties between uh, T posts. And I can grow a fairly good sized butternut squash of it. Um, I gently train the tendrils up. And I also, I use this uh, thick, wide horticultural st stretchy tape, but you could use rags or old sheets or something like that, uh, you know, uh, just to get it up uh, off. This is the hoarding over here that uh, it's used horizontally on uh, flowers, but that, that's a good point. That last slide, I use it on peppers to keep the plants from falling over in a heavy fruit load, but I use it vertically for squash. I use it for peas, beans, and squashes, and then when I first started using it, I was incredulous that it could support a heavy bean fence, uh, let alone a winter squash fence, but it can. But if you have a big fruit, it's probably better to use some more rigid wire. I've got this wonderful concrete wall that I, I did grow 
a, something called Naples lawn. It was the only seed I had last year and it did okay at going up that wall. So I was gonna try it with. The other thing I'm doing is watering because I don't have a drip water available yet. I've sunk pots into the ground to serve as like Oyas, you know, O-L-L-A-S, mm. the eight inch, six inch pots, six inch pots down. And then I fill that with water uh, around the plant to try and get, because once the squash gets big, it's pretty hard to get water in yeah. near the roots. Well, that's inventive. Is anybody, yeah, nobody's tried that yet, huh? <laughs> I have no idea if it's really that. working well. That and then uh, uh, there are uh, narrower diameter uh, uh, cylinders you can put in the ground. They sometimes use the trees and lawns. Oh yeah. Okay. But yeah, that sounds inventive, and you can't beat the price. It's cheap. Yeah, the price is good. You have to. <laughs> it's a little tricky when some animal comes in and burrows a tunnel right up to it, and you, you fill it up, and you say, "Oh my God, well the water's just going down." But maybe it's going the right place. You know, if that uh, burrowing animal is so. Uh, You've been gardening there for two years. You put on a copious amount of compost, uh, and yet it's going to take a few years. That cha chaparral, uh, the, cha the nice. chaparral, chaparral is one of my favorite plant communities in California, but it's not known for its rich, deep soils. So no, it's pretty, pretty poor. That would be uh, down there in the Salinas Valley. <laughs> That's where you're. <laughs> yeah, I, I miss my clay over in Santa Clara. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyhow, keep at it. But the prescription is uh, try a cover crop and a legume grass cover crop. Yes, yeah. did that big cover crop last winter. Compost and just keep. Thank keep. you. Good. Uh, boy, you must have tremendous views up there. Yeah. <laughs> hot days and cold nights too, huh? Very hot. Yeah, great. Uh, there's a passage in the beginning. I'm a big John. Stone. I think I read something uh, last time from him. Uh, there's a passage in the beginning of his East of Eden describing as a young boy how he viewed the valley and he viewed the east side, your side, the pinnacles as warm and friendly. And the west side, the Santa Lucia is as dark and foreboding. And I've always had the exact opposite. Oh, because I'm from the east and it's lush and green. Ah, the Santa Lucia is so warm and inviting. Ah, so barren and stark like that but anyhow uh it's kind of a god's country whether you believe in a deity or not up there okay all right anybody have any more questions yeah this is dara again i have a question actually about strawberries sure um i've been growing them for three or four years now never very dedicated and this year i thought okay i'm really gonna do it right so I am getting more and better strawberries, but a lot of my strawberries, even though they look really good, they don't really have much flavor. And I'm just wondering if there's something in particular I might do differently. Uh, do you know what the variety is? Uh, I used to, I don't right now. <laughs> We all suffer that syndrome. This time. Yeah, maybe I'm growing the wrong variety. Uh, it could be, uh, and and it's not the wrong variety. It's the wrong variety for this look. For the for the yeah, and um, I bought them bare root uh, two years ago at San Lorenzo, and I wrote down what they were, but that information has since been lost. So what in Live Oak, where yeah. I'm at, where what's a good variety for me? Two best varieties along the coast here are Albion and Chandler. Okay, Al I know for sure one of them's an Albion, so that's probably the best berries, and then a Chandler. Al Albion is more productive, but Chandler is much tastier. Chandler used to be the strawberry to grow. It's kind of fallen out of favor with growers, largely because it's not as productive. It's very good tasting. The other thing with well, strawberry- I care about the taste. <laughs> yeah, that's what we grow them for, right? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I guess. My kids will eat anything, even the green ones, but I need it to be perfect. <laughs> One time when the kids were young, we were up the coast picking a lot of berries, <laughs> and one of the kids, they were like, I don't know, five, six, or seven. Oh, they sure are crunchy, Mom, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So uh, the other thing is you see the, the, the extremely raised furrows they grow uh, uh, strawberries on, and it's kind of aids in terms of water and drainage and, and performance, so uh, raised bed. Okay. Well, mine are kind of in a mound right now, but I, I think I, I really think it's the variety and I'm, I'm going to make sure that next year I have the variety really is a big influencer in terms of taste. Okay, thank you.
I'm growing delicious strawberries in live oak. I think they're seascape mostly. Seascape is also another excellent variety. Uh, and it's funny. And I'm growing them in straw bales and they're doing really well. <laughs> Ooh, that's a great idea. Seascape is a good tasting one. Yeah. I'd like to see pictures of that. Uh, you may. Thank you. I, I, I will share with you if I can find. Yeah, I know how to find you. OK, uh, great. Thank back you. you. Delisa's praises a little bit, which is she's a, okay. actually both literally a master gardener and figuratively a master gardener. She belongs to the group <laughs> and the master gardener. <laughs> Uh, but mostly I have the honor and the pleasure to serve on the board of the Friends of the Farm and Garden and um, I'm thinking this president. excellent program. I'm thinking president for life, eh? Uh, <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Ah. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the future. Ah. <laughs> we have some more classes coming up. And um, the next one is going to be botan botanical baking, another one of our Board members is going to be teaching that, and she's quite the baker, Ella Fleming. Ella Fleming, she was my assistant for five years, a former apprentice, and she is a, one magical person. Too. She's a delight, mm -hmm. and she does beautiful work. Amazing talent. Yep. And then we're going to do a virtual version of our sketching in the garden class, which we've offered before. And by the grace of UC, we will be going to the farm. Uh, to do an actual sketching in the garden work work day as well. So that's going to be part of our new model hybrid. We do a free everybody can come <clears throat> virtual event and then we follow it up with a hands on lab, so to speak. Um, we're doing the same thing with seed saving and seed sovereignty. That's um, always a popular class. And then we'll be having a follow on seed exchange. And then um, Top 10 medicinal herbs. This is Paula Granger. She's a famous herbalist in the county. And um, she's going to allow, I believe it's 12 of our, um, of our Friends of the Farm and Garden members to come into her backyard and do a walkabout. So that's another reason to become a member of the Friends of the Farm and Garden. <laughs> Lisa, are we having that thing on October 24th? It's a Friends. Member October 24th for members. Yes, we're having an event. I'm not sure. We're not confirmed on the 24th, but we are going to be having a, um, a membership meeting that is always a bit of a fest. It's got food and wine and, um, and usually a featured speaker. And this year it's going to be Oren, who's going to be talking about peppers. And we'll be doing a pepper tasting, a pepper viewing, a pepper selection discussion so he'll he'll give us some um, information and make it a real party humble brag you ought to join and come because uh peppers <laughs> are one of my favorite you think i'm excited about winter squash listen to me when i talk about peppers <laughs> yes and thank you Van vanessa for um putting up the events and how to join and become a member so that you can come to this event great and soon at some point Soon we'll be having classes. This is an actual photo of the farm um, at the at the uh, children's garden at the through the porthole of what is called a spirit nest. This huge. It's a beautiful wood sculpture. It's just oh, gorgeous. Woven down in Big Sur, I believe, by Indigenous people uh, and transported to the farm. It's just amazing. Come check it out. The farm's open. Uh, it is. Um, it is right on the edge of the. Um, Life Lab property that's adjacent to the farm. So we this, look forward to seeing you there. Yes. I, I actually, my name's Patricia. I tried to share the hog wire fencing that I used for my squash. I don't know exactly how to share the image with you. Um, um, you could only share the image if you emailed it to me. Um, okay. Or if you, um, and then I can send it out with the rest of uh, the information that we're going to send everybody on the on the class. Okay. We can okay. get back to you directly. Let me also give out my email. I uh, often don't respond or only respond with an electronic grunt. Uh, but for people like you, I will respond. Um, put like winter squash in the title or something like that. Uh, send it to me. I'd be glad to. If any of you have any questions on any type of garden, we 
more than happy to correspond. And we've been doing, I don't know, 8, 10, 12 of these over the last year. And I have to say that the uh, steady trickle of emails and pictures and the dialogue back and forth with folks has been the most rewarding part of the whole affair. This talking in front of a camera makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a last minute question here about rhubarb. Okay. Somebody would like to transplant rhubarb. Ah. I don't know if that's pulling the roots apart or if we're talking about a January planting. Well, I'm laughing because uh, we had a bowl of rhubarb at the farm for 30 years and for some reason it was great. And you can't beat strawberry rhubarb pie and, and so that's for some silly reason we decided to take it out. This is a 30 yeah. established planting. We were young and foolish and we wouldn't be deterred. Uh, deterred. Uh, we ended up taking a four foot moat around each root mass and excavated the, the, the root mass. Yeah. And I don't know how many years after that, the rhubarb kept popping up. So, uh, you can do it if you want to do it to transfer. We were trying to get rid of it. But if you do, do it to transfer, yes, as Denise suggests, you should do it in December, January when the plant is dormant. Uh, you get as much of the root mass as you can. Well, I have more information now from Amy, who asked the question. Um, rhubarb's usually planted bare root, but apparently she started from seed. Have wow. you heard of starting rhubarb from seed? Yeah, I have, uh, although I've never done it. And it's one of those things like you can start asparagus from seeds, you can start apples from seeds. Um, <laughs> the reason that you buy you know, root pieces to plant is they are uh, cultivated varieties that have been bred and usually are far superior to seedling material. However, with rhubarb, seedlings are perfectly acceptable. Uh, they may not be as fully colored, uh, red uh, tinge and all that as the main varieties, but yeah, you could do that. Uh, and you would like to know when to transplant the seed. How big are the seedlings? Amy, you can unmute. Um, hi, hi, the seedlings are about four inches. Yeah. You could do it now uh, and, and get a considerable jump going forward uh, for the rest of the season. Uh, pick a, don't do it during the upcoming heat wave. Where do you live? Uh, uh, Mid Carmel Valley on a thousand foot uh, up ridge. Wow. <laughs> wow. Who's got it better than that? Well, maybe the woman who lives there. Fire danger. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would just stay away from this uh, upcoming a uh, little bit of uh, heat wave. We're going to get Thursday through Sunday. So do it late in the day. Uh, make sure the soil is moist, both the soil you're moving out of the plant out of and into, uh, and then do it as quickly as you can and water in immediately. Uh, if you can provide a little shade for a few days, uh, that would be good too. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, um, we're going to wrap up now. Thank you, everybody, for participating. No um, feel Thank free you. to send your information um, or questions that you have yeah. to the email addresses that'll come in the follow-up email. Or an ORIN at ucse.edu. I'll answer your questions. I look forward to them. Thanks a lot, folks. Yeah, I put it in the chat. You are now, you are now exposed to everyone. We'll get a million emails. <laughs> Couple of emails. Uh, all right. And, and uh, the Caspis work can't happen without you. So thank you for any donations you want to make to this this little link here, which we will now. Um, sorry, everyone loves me and wants to call me. Um, Vanessa, can you put this link in the in the chat? Let's see, I I keep uh, blowing it here. Um. Yes, and at the end of the deck, you're gonna get this deck. Um, there's a guide on growing winter squash. The uh, integrated pest management site that we, we link to with a bug part is there. A soil lab, if you haven't had your, your soil tested, that is an awesome thing to do. And some of our favorite seed sources. Let me also, uh, although she's uh, modest and wants to be off camera, uh, shout out to Vanessa Hackerman. Yay, Vanessa. What her job title is, but if you need something done, she can do it. And she's a tech whiz and a great smile and laugh to boot. So thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. All righty, folks. Um, thank you for coming. 
and I'll be sending email to everyone who attended this class or any of the earlier ones. And we'll talk about whether we really want to get together in September or just meet for um, a food exchange in September, in October. We we're going to do that in October. So. All right. Take care. Good evening, folks. Thanks a lot. Happy squashing. <laughs> <laughs>